This is a digital um, conference, and we should have known, given that we started the digital world in about March of this year when the uh, pandemic hit us. And so we didn't expect that we would have delays, but be that it may, I think it's a clear that maybe digital infrastructure needs to be used. I uh, will start um, with this infrastructure uh, panel to discuss maybe um, some takeouts of the South African um, Construction and Recovery Plan, which talks to and targets infrastructure and infrastructure led recovery. And so to attract private sector investment, this is seen as a low hanging fruit. And as if um, South Africa was not already last two quarters of 2019, we started seeing the economic downturn and the recession, following which we started seeing economic downgrades um, by the ratings agencies, followed by continued um, low levels of growth. And of course, the pandemic hit us in March of um, 2020. Um, South Africa has been on a, as long as well, the economy plan and South Africa specific one talks to priority sectors which target nine sectors and of those nine sectors nine, um, four of the top ones are really infrastructure related because the value chain of infrastructure is going to be what stimulates growth um, as well as job creation and the construction industry getting back on stream. Now the four areas which we believe we can talk to this more this afternoon guess is the aggressive um, infrastructure investment, it's the energy um, uh, security, as well as gender equality and economic inclusion of women and youth, and also the greening of the economy. Those are just the top four of the nine priority sectors as I indicated. And as you can see, they all relate back to um, infrastructure. So without limiting our conversation to those areas, we believe that those are significant in our discussion. I will start off by introducing our panel and we'll start off with the latest so observe protocol. Um, I'd like to welcome Minister Patricia DeLille to the panel. Um, all our panelists are already on board, but I will start off by introducing Minister. Minister was appointed as the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure by Cyril Ramaphosa in 20, our President Cyril Ramaphosa in 2019 in May. Um, she's a seasoned politician and public servant and has been in all three spheres of government since the first democratic parliament in 1994. She has been fighting injustice for more than 45 years and was part of the team which led the constitutional negotiations and the team who drafted the South African um, constitution. She has served as the mayor of Cape Town for seven years where accountability and clean governance were cornerstones of her term. And this is something we expect as we see her implementing the infrastructure plan. And we will talk a little bit more about that. She spearheaded progressive projects such as using infrastructure investment as a lever um, to spur economic growth, developed a transit oriented development strategy and many others to redress projects such as the restitution to reverse the legal and apartheid spatial planning. In her latest role as Minister of the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, her focus is to drive spatial and environmental justice and equality, to clamp down on corruption and ensure that public land and public buildings are used for public good. Her focus is also to drive infrastructure implementation as part of the government economic recovery plan in a manner that will create the conditions for the private sector to contribute to the economic growth and create much needed jobs for the people of South Africa. With that, I would like to introduce the minister. And before she, I ask her to set the scene for us following the implementation of the sustainable investment uh, or sustainable infrastructure development symposium in June, 20, uh, in June of this year, I would like to ask her to start by setting the scene for us to say what the priorities had been for, for her and her team, as well as what the update has been to date. But before I ask her to respond, I'm going to introduce the remainder of the panels and I will start with Dr. Ramakhopa. Um, Dr. Ramakhopa is um, currently the head of the Investment and Infrastructure Office in the Office of the Presidency. Prior to this, he was the Houting MEC for Economic Development, um, Agriculture and Environment. Previously, he held the position of executive mayor 
in the city of Tswane between 2010 and 2016. At the time, he was one of the youngest mayors of a metropolitan in the country. Dr. Ramkhopa's previous positions include the position of CEO for both the Metropolitan Trading Company and Johannesburg Market, and he previously was the deputy chairperson of the Board of the Trade and Investment um, in Limpopo. Dr. Ramakhopa holds a PhD from the University of Pretoria, a master's in administration from the University of Pretoria, as well as a master's in business leadership from the University of South Africa. He completed his BSc in civil engineering in Durban, Westville in 1998. I would just talk to some of his accomplishments. He's got, uh, I think uh, he's quite well known in this industry, especially with regards to the infrastructure implementation and this uh, infrastructure plan that he's um, that he's leading. But I will talk to he, him being an avid reader and enjoying and following sports. He's actively involved in the soccer development in his home township of Atridgeville and once owned a team that played the ABC Multiple League. Um, in his free time, he enjoys and offers lessons in leadership and public management at various tertiary institutions as a guest lecturer, um, something he does pro bono. He has a motto which he lives by, which is, if you live truthfully, you shall prevail against all adversity. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Ramakhopa, and with that, I uh, will ask him following um, the minister some targeted questions thereafter. Also joining us, and this side is the investment side and representing the banks, and more specifically is the New Development Bank, is Mr. Manali Ratoma, um, who is currently the Director General of the New Development Bank um, in the African Regional Office, and he's been in that position since 2018. Um, the National Development Bank is a multilateral bank established in, by Brazil, South Africa, Russia, China, and India with the objective of financing infrastructure as well as developmental and sustainable projects in BRICS, and the BRICS country was actually previously called the BRICS Bank, and other emerging economies in developing countries, complementing the efforts of multilateral and regional financial institutions towards global growth and development. Prior to that, he spent seven years at National Treasury of South Africa during the period he held positions of DDG, of head of economic policy, and he was also the acting head of international and regional policy as the DDG. He joined the National Treasury as the chief director for liability, a liability management within the assets and liability management division. And prior to that, he was um, the chief economist at Teba Investment Corporation after having worked at APSA. And last but not least is also a big force in the industry, which is also on the funding side. And this is Mr. Ndabezile Mkise, who is um, the CIO of the ESCOM Pension and Provident Fund. And he also is the inaugural um, chairperson of the Asset Owners Forum in South Africa. Ndabem Mkise is a married father of three children. He is also the Chief Investment Officer of the ESCOM Pension and Provident Fund, where he has oversights of assets worth about 150 billion rand and manages a team of 22 individuals in the investment management unit. He is a CFA, a Chartered Financial Analyst, as well as a Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst. <clears throat> he also holds a Bachelor of Science in Actuarial um, Science, a Bachelor of Science in Actuarial Science from UCT, and he's been involved in the South African financial services industry for more than 20 years. He started in the actuarial field with Old Mutual in 1998 and then moved on to asset management industry in 2003. He has held various roles in the industry, including analyst at and portfolio management at Coronation Fund Managers, Prudential Investment Managers, Stanlip Asset Management, and Dabe is currently the dip. He started off as the deputy CIO of EPPF in May 2014, where he progressed to be the CIO in 2015. He's also the independent um, non-executive director of Fairvest Property Fund. With that, I would like to welcome all the guests and panelists on this panel, and we'll open the floor by asking Minister to please give us an overview or just brief highlights of the quick successes um, of the implementation of the Sustainable Infrastructure Development Symposium targets. 
Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just very hot in Cape Town today. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, President Sir Ramaphosa describes our infrastructure investment plan as the flywheel of our economy and is leading in our economic reconstruction and recovery too. So what progress have we made? South Africa now, we have our own investment plan. Um, we have collected projects from all three spheres of government, um, also the state-owned entities and from the private sector. And from that plan, uh, we have pitched it at various uh, funding institutions. And we have also gazetted 62 of um, 62 infrastructure projects. We were very successful in June, 20, uh, 23rd of June, with the investment symposium. Uh, led by the president, where we were able to get commitments of 430 billion. And Dr. Ramakhopa will give us more detail on that too. But we've also established what we call infrastructure South Africa. And that is to deal with the fragmentation of infrastructure, to make sure that we put all infrastructure projects through a methodology where we can make sure that they are bankable, they are feasible, and they're ready to go to the market. And Infrastructure South Africa is currently led by Dr. Ramakhopa. I just call him our master builder. So yes, long term, what we are focusing on is to develop a credible pipeline like we've started doing already. But uh, in our interactions with the private sector, we agreed on three issues. And the one is that our pipeline must be bankable. It must be ready for implementation. We also agree that we need to establish a long-term infrastructure plan, which we are busy with up to 2045. And then of course, the fragmentation of infrastructure. So uh, one key area that we've identified where we did need to do some more work is on the issue of project preparation. Project preparation um, lessons that we've learned from the past is that we need to invest more in project preparation so that we're able to, to, to de-risk um, the projects. And National Treasury government has made available 440 million for that purpose, but we still need some more support with specific projects for project preparation. And therefore, on the third and the fourth, we had a round table on project preparation where we have pitched with various banks and multilateral institutions and pension funds, uh, 28 projects uh, that do need some funding for project preparation. Now, we're also looking at three sources of funding. The, the first is that we are, we are looking for funding from the private sector. Uh, this, the second source will be funding from the Fiscus, especially for the social infrastructure projects. And uh, then government has committed 100 billion rand over the next 10 years uh, in the infrastructure fund. And the infrastructure fund is being established to make it a blended finding, uh, funded finance mechanism. So that is operational now. We're also planning now to go to the market for green infrastructure bonds, and we have made great progress there. But lastly, if I can just deal with uh, the trust deficit between the public sector and the private sector. We're quite aware about that, and we've worked hard over the past nine months uh, to deal with the trust deficit. And, and the cause of the trust deficit, of course, is, is, is corruption in our country. And therefore, our infrastructure investment plan is underpinned by an anti-corruption strategy and an anti-corruption forum, which is led by the Special Investigating Unit, comprising of private sector, civil society and government. Because as government, we have to illustrate that we are able to turn the tide, that we are able to take action against the corrupt and uh, the delinquent in the system, and so this anti-corruption strategy is underpinning the whole infrastructure plan. So now uh, going forward is that 
the partnership with the private sector. Government cannot do it alone. And we also realize that. And I want to thank the private sector already for all the help that they've given us to develop the infrastructure investment plan. This is just the first phase of the plan. We are looking already at the second phase for more infrastructure projects. But the opportunities are huge, huge in our country. And that's why I appeal to you to invest in South Africa so that we can create more jobs and we can bring decent work opportunities to all our people. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Minister, and thank you so much for dealing with the pain issues such as the trust deficit as well as um, policy certainty. And I think we'll talk to a little bit more of that as, as we get into the conversation. But with what you have said, I think um, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, or rather, Dr. Ramakopa to just talk to us a little bit more about the first phase of this partnership with uh, private sector, as well as the funding that has been raised for the 28 projects and what is still required um, at this stage. Over to you, Dr. Ramakopa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and, and thank you very much for to the minister for for laying the foundation. Just just to to say the following is that the, the unique feature of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, as uh, unveiled by the president, is that uh, it really represents a a consensus position, if you like, that has been sufficiently canvassed with the private sector. Obviously, the state can abrogate, abrogate its responsibility to provide leadership, but I think that the, the manner in which it was conceptualized, I mean, it was an exercise of co-creation. So the private sector was uh, at the table and they helped to really define, if you like, um, uh, what should constitute uh, the primary agenda. Um, uh, at least in the to help us re recover from this uh, very difficult situation. And, and just to illustrate that level of commitment from the private sector, I, I always say that the private sector has got two dual motives. The, the first one is a selfish or commercial motives to ensure that they maximize returns to their shareholders. But the second one is a, is a patriotic one, and I think it was more pronounced out, out of this exercise. So what has happened is that the, over the past six months, we have, uh, if you like, developed a, an intimate relationship with the private sector, almost like a communion. And, and this derives from the fact that uh, we have admitted, I think, in the public sector that uh, the technical and financial engineering skills have been hemorrhaged over a period of time. And that explains why the public sector has not been in a position to produce and replenish a credible project pipeline uh, that the, mm. the private sector can and, and I mean, if you were to ask uh, Davi here, you were to ask Monale and many other private uh, sector players, the financiers in particular, they will tell you that uh, all good projects that can be funded have been funded. So all they are waiting for is for us to produce projects. And that's why we, we, we approach, say, can you help us in the interim uh, with those technical and financial engineering skills to help us to package projects. And essentially, we're looking for projects that have got the following uh, characteristic features. They are underpinned by sustainable and independent uh, revenue streams. They are far advanced in the project uh, life cycle, post uh, feasibility, so that the, the prospects of getting them to, to financial close are are significantly enhanced. And then we isolated the sectors that in our considered opinion. And this is backed really by literature that suggests that the network industries uh, gives you the highest potential, if you like, uh, for employment creation, their job job elasticity, opening up uh, the, efficient, the economy and introducing efficiencies in the economy. And we have been working with the private sector in that regard. Uh, we have been able to mine over 276 of these projects and graduated about uh, 50 of them and got them to a point where there's firm commitments to the tune of 340 billion rands. And you have seen that the president has begun to unveil some of those projects because part of the trust deficit that the minister talks to, um, it has to mm -hmm. do with the fact that I think we're very big on talk and policy articulation and there's very little attention on application and, and deliver. The private sector is helping us there. The second part, the minister has touched on it is with regards to innovative financing instruments. We know that the fiscal receipts uh, are declining, the, 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 the fiscal matrix has deteriorated, 
Uh, so essentially, there's no fiscal headspace. So we must look at, uh, if you like, innovative uh, financing instruments. I'm saying innovative immediately uh, because uh, they are not novel what we're introducing. They are very prevalent in other parts of the world. But I think in the country, mm. we have not gone that route of the complacency of uh, the national pairs having to fund all of this. And that's why we have started that uh, thorough going engagement with the private sector. And now we are for, suddenly we are having conversation with the asset owners to say, what is your appetite to participate in this space? And in the round table that the minister referred to, the asset owner says, no, we're happy to finance infrastructure as an asset class, but just make sure that the project you give us, uh, if you like good quality project. And that's why we are arguing that in the state, there has to be a considerable investment uh, upstream of the project for project preparation and, uh, um, uh, and packaging. And then just the last one that I want to mention uh, has to do with the kind of reforms that are necessary. So the president in the address makes reference to Operation Ruling Lela. Essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a deliberate and orchestrated effort at the apex office in the land, the presidency working together with national treasury to say that there has to be some degree of reforms, structural reforms to some extent, to allow for private sector to participate. I mean, if you look at the infrastructure spend, the timeline over a period of time, is that your PPP as one of uh, uh, the in, in, in instruments outside the fiscals, they account for about 2% of the total spend. And we know now that uh, with the pressures that are on the fiscals, the, the PPPs invariably, together with other financing instruments, have to play a disproportionate role in financing infrastructure. Part of the reason why um, there's um, sometimes an inordinate amount of time for us to complete, uh, bring PPPs to the financial conclusion is because of the elaborate uh, legislation, but also it, whole, it has to do also in part with the, the, the skills that are residing in the state. So we need to fix that part um, and, and, and the reforms. I mean, there are multiple areas that requires attention, issues of licensing, permitting, um, for to issue a, a, um, a, a water use license, you must go to National Department of Water. You look for a record of decision for an EIA, you are going to provincial authority. You need licensing mm -hmm. for or a municipal connection, you must go to a local authority. You can see that uh, the private sector, with all their good intentions, uh, they are undermined by the, the level of bureaucracy that is there, or if you like multiple touch points for you to be able to get those uh, approvals. And that's why the minister talks about the reconfiguration of the institutional framework in the state to allow for a single window of entry so that uh, if you want to make investment, obviously is a function of the size of that investment, there's one point of entry. And then the minister, I think she has uh, dealt with the issues of malfeasance and leakage. I think that's going to undermine the work that we are doing. Uh, in, uh, people invading construction site, uh, stopping project. It's not going to help. So the state must come to the party uh, and it must uh, exert its uh, authority. You know, one of uh, the principal roles of the state is to uh, use its uh, monopoly over the legitimate use of violence. Essentially, is to exert its authority to ensure that the projects are able to move and that the conversation must be nuanced as you deal with those who are invading um, a project site. You need to accept that there has to be a thoroughgoing transformation. You must have genuine quality conversation with the lo local actors who want to participate in the construction site, at the level of ownership, quality participation, subcontracting, providing of material. We'll attend to that the entire value chain. Uh, so mm -hmm. I thought I must just say those. I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. All right, great. Th thank you, Dr. Ramucho. But I think you touch on very important points, um, including solving for this fragmentation that you talked to, um, specifically, let's say, in the water sector or even the higher education sector, for example, where um, student accommodation is being offered by different institutions, but not all coordinated, for example, at the departments of higher education. And so you also speak to, you know, breaking down the barriers um, and the red tape by looking at changing the Public Management Finance Act, as well as maybe the Municipal Finance Act. I know these are long-term goals, but surely there must be some quick wins as well in doing so. One of the other things that we know um, from the investment community is that the PPP model, which you refer to is one that certainly does work. It has worked in the renewable energy um, uh, independent power producer uh, format. 
that REAP program attracted over 192 billion rand worth of investments, both from DFIs, smart, um, banks, um, asset managers or fund managers, and therefore pension funds. And so we know that that is a model that can be certainly cookie cutter and pasted potentially in the water industry and many other industries. So I'll leave that to for discussion in a short while, but whilst we're talking about funders and the investments and the, the purses that are available, and also considering the fact that you've got to play at different um, capital structures, um, you spoke about the investment by DFIs for the project preparation. Um, when I do get to Mr. Mkiza, I'm going to ask him um, whether pension funds would be able to invest or provide technical skills in that area, uh, as we understand their liabilities to be, or even their participation to be more at financial close. But we'll get to that question when we deal with Mr. Mkiza. But right now, I'd like to bring in um, uh, Mr. Ramoza and just ask him what his view is and what others are doing at the New Development Bank in order to fund specific infrastructure for the BRICS countries and what their appetite is for South Africa as well as what has been put forward in the Sustainable um, uh, Infrastructure De um, Development Symposium. Monale? Mr. Razoma? Monale, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can Thank you hear you. me? Did... The... Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, to you. Wonderful. No, you ask, uh, Fulu, what is the appetite for the, uh, for the NDB? Uh, over the last, um, you know, few few years of the conference, we had, we had, we have been uh, we, we have been pledging uh, as the as, as the bank um, the amount that we you know, we wish to invest in South Africa, and I think thus far uh, we have been largely successful. I mean, despite the challenges, which I will touch on, I will touch on uh, briefly. Um, in the last two years, we have uh, dedicated uh, just over three billion dollars on infrastructure in, in South Africa. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, uh, has been that you know, much of the much of the investment.